Matthew 8, verse number 5. I want you to see here. Matthew 8, verse 5. The Bible says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Then the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. I'm going to stop right there and, and help you understand that word marvel means to be very physically exclaimed, uh, a, a taken back, a gasp. Jesus marveled. And well, let's look what he marveled about. It says, And said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You know what that's talking about? You and me. Right. Not just the people of Israel going to heaven. Many from the east and the west are going to be there in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. And there shall be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed. You see that phrase? Let's read that again. Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in that selfsame hour. I want to speak to you today. On the simple topic of the levels of faith in the life of the Christian. You know, many people today are represented from different walks of life and different, different uh, life experiences, but if we are to all boil down church, I would say that it can be boiled down into three different categories today. And we're going to be looking at those three categories, but I want you to understand the whole topic, the whole purpose of this message today is to address your faith and mine. Because faith is really the, well, the Bible says the, substance, the evidence of things hoped for, the, or substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is what you're practicing today. But there are different levels of faith in the life of the Christian. Not every person in this room has the same faith that the person across the aisle has. Would you look at Matthew chapter number 9 now, just a page over. I want you to see another example. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou, art, thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to, say it with me, Your faith be it unto you. So we see a common theme here. God Jesus, the Son of God, is addressing people's faith. And he's really telling them, he's saying, based on your level of faith, I will perform the work that you're asking me to do. Look at Matthew chapter 15 now. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 28. This is the Syrophoenician woman. The Bible says, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. See the phrase? Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. If you, would you look up here and listen, the Bible defines faith in Hebrews, in verse number 1 of chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible continues in the later part of the chapter, in verse number 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is the very foundation of what we build our lives upon. Right. You got saved because of faith in God. Right. 
You follow, you follow God today in faith. Anybody ever seen God before? Nobody. Anybody ever, uh, anybody ever had uh, been present at the crucifixion? Nobody. Anybody ever saw the risen Lord at all after his, uh, after his burial? Nobody. So the very fact that you're here today celebrating the Lord being risen from the dead, there's some semblance of faith in your heart that attributes to says, yes, I believe this happened. Faith is what Christianity is based upon. In fact, every religion in the world is based on faith. Even evolution, the, the religion of evolution, you say, well, that's, a, that's science. No, that's not. It's a religion. You're putting faith in something that you cannot see or prove or watch. Nobody's there. Nobody was there to watch the Big Bang. And can I add, and I'll say this, that I've never seen an explosion cause anything but chaos and destruction. Why would it change all of a sudden? But what I would like to look at today is the levels of faith in every believer's life and challenge you on where your faith lies today. Because sometimes faith is cyclical. Faith depreciates, then it appreciates, and then it goes back down again and rises again. Faith is not a constant in our life. Sometimes circumstances challenge your faith. My hope and prayer today, this morning, is that your faith would grow even just a little bit. Even just a little bit that it might grow. Number one, I want you to see a category of faith which is little faith. Little faith. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 9. I'm going to read, but you follow along with me once you get there. This is the occasion of the miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus is asking his disciples, he's saying, uh, once shall we buy bread that these may eat? He's asking them, what, what do you think we should do, guys? The Bible says in verse number 7, Philip answered and said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. Look at that phrase. But what are they among so many? What I'd like to submit to you today is the evidence of little faith. This is the evidence of little faith. Now you stay there. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 8. I want to give you another example of these disciples and their little faith. Because this is the occasion where Jesus stills the waves. And in verse number 24, and Behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea of Matthew 8. And so much that the ship was covered with waves, but he, Jesus, was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Even though these disciples followed Jesus Christ literally every day of his ministry, they still came to a point where their faith was tested and challenged. And at points in our life as Christians, we can get to that point. Where we have faith in God, but it's minuscule. It's little. Many times it's the result of looking more at our problem rather than looking more at our solution. Now I kid you not, I'm not preaching this today because of Wednesday. Because of the storm. because of all. I'm not preaching this today because of that. This is already much in preparation, but I believe God knows what he's doing. But what happens is many times Christians' faith begin to falter and to wane away because we look at problems more than the solution to our problem. And here's what, here's what happens. You're absolutely right in coming to the conclusion that this is a, uh, a situation that you cannot handle, that you're not capable of overcoming, and you're absolutely right in saying that. But you forget the solution. The disciples had enough sense to come to Jesus in that boat, and they said, Lord, save us, we perish. They knew to go to the right person. They went to the Lord. But their immediate response after that was, we perish. As if Jesus is going to 
call them in to be a disciple, and then bring them on that boat and drown them all. Go ahead and chuckle. That's all right. You can laugh. As if he's going to go out. Thank you, Michaela. I appreciate that. As if he's going to go out there and say, all right, guys, here's the, here's the grand finale. You're going to be swimming with the fishes. I mean, really, in all reality. But that's what these fellows came to. And as silly and as incredulous that sounds, it was a very real problem in their eyes. See, most of the problems we have in our life, looking back, looking back, well, that, I was really blown out of that, out of proportion a little bit. I got a little needlessly concerned about that situation. What the immediate response of the Christian ought to be when problems and trials come in your life is say, Lord, save me. That's it. Don't add, we perish. Because if you do or not, that's on God's time, not yours. The disciples, they got distracted by the storm. They had little faith in the person who was with them on that boat. We often think that to ourselves that it's almost like we say to ourselves, God is not aware of my problems. Or else they wouldn't be in the situation that I'm in. We think to ourselves and say, God allowed this health problem into my life, but he must have forgotten about me because I'm not getting any better. Friend, he's not forgotten about you. He's in your boat. Amen? He's in your boat with you. The disciples looked at the problem of feeding the multitude. They saw the problem more than Jesus. Just like in the situation on the boat, here in the situation now with feeding the 5,000, they looked at the overwhelming obstacle in front of them and said, we can't do anything about this. And you're right, they couldn't. But they forgot who the solution to their problem was. It's Jesus Christ. See, if we're not careful... We can let our fear and our insecurity erode and chip away at the foundation of our faith. Your fear and my fear and my insecurity and the circumstances that come into my life will wane away and chip away at what you stand upon. And if you continue to stop building your faith, and reinforcing your faith through the word of God, through being in church, what's going to happen is that finally one day your faith is going to crumble. This will get you out of church. This will get you away from this book. And this will get you out of step with God. Your faith will crumble and fall apart. However, we, even with little faith, even with little faith, minuscule, insignificant faith in our eyes, God can still accomplish miraculous things. We can adopt this level of faith, this little faith, from a lack of matured faith. Just because everybody, just because somebody has little faith doesn't mean that's bad. Because it could have started out that they just got saved and they've not seen God work in their life past their salvation. That alone should increase your faith that much more. But sometimes Christians get to the point, they said, I'm not seeing God that work that much. I'm not seeing him be evident in my life. And so they respond with little faith. This is why I preached on Wednesday. A lack of you being faithful in the church and a lack of me being faithful in the church is a, is a mark of spiritual immaturity. That decision of when 5.30 comes rolling around, whether, what place you should be, what address you should be at, largely the result of that decision will be based on the depth of your maturity as a Christian. I don't care how long you've been saved, and I don't care what, if you carry some title or whatever. Listen, your response to those questions will determine how great of a faith you have in God and how mature of a Christian you really are. Because if you're a spiritually immature Christian... Sunday night's not going to be a big deal to you. If you're a spiritually mature Christian, Wednesday night's not going to be a big deal to you. Now, you might say, well, Pastor, it's your responsibility to be here on Wednesday and Sunday. It's everybody's responsibility. Just because, just because I happen to be your pastor, and listen, I know it's, and I'll address this, I know it's been awkward really, released recently of, of what to address me. Listen, I'm your pastor. I'm not Pastor Matt, I'm Pastor. Pastor Thar, I am your pastor because God has called me as your shepherd. 
I'm your shepherd. And this is Pastor Brandenburg, not Brother Doug. Amen. And not Pastor Doug. This is Pastor Brandenburg. That's free for you, by the way. Amen. Uh, listen, hey, your level of faith is going to indicate to other people who you really are as a Christian. Here's some ways that you can stunt your Christian growth. Because that's what's going to be the evidence of when you get saved, there ought to be growth in your life. There ought to be, I mean, as babies, and I'll, uh, Sister, Sister Hanina Kinsman and, and Brother Matt, uh, they have a brand new little baby, Gabriella. Sweet, sweetest little girl I could ever see. And you know, there would be something alarming in that little girl's life if she didn't grow. Now, it's easy to expect and say, well, Gabriella shouldn't be running right now. But probably by two years old, she should probably be getting there about now. Right. See, you as mamas, you have this mental checklist of what you expect your kids ought to be doing at a certain age. Okay. Such is the case of the children of God. Right. When you've been saved for a period of time, there should be a level of maturity that has, should have been there that was not there when you first got saved. Right. It ought to be growing. But here's what can prevent your spiritual growth. Or how to, rather, how to prevent your spiritual growth. Number one, decide to learn something new about the Bible each week. This is going to help prevent stunted growth in your life. Decide to learn some, something about the Bible every week. Now, I stand here. I'm not, some, I'm not some theologian. I'm not some, you know, I'm not the greatest Bible student out there. But I try to sit down every week and try to study the Bible. Because it helps me develop my faith in God. Number two, spend more time in church and deciding to get more out of it than what you are now. That's going to develop your faith. See, what will determine an immature Christian versus a mature Christian is this. Is, are you being here to be fed? Or are you here to serve other people who will be fed? Okay? Babies... Gimme, 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 gimme. Babies do that, don't they? Mom and dad say, oh, here, honey, let me feed you. That's the difference. Spiritually mature Christians say, I want, I want, gimme, provide for me, take care of me. Mature Christians say, how can I be a help and a blessing to you? That's the difference here. Now, again, just if you're one or the other, that's not based on you alone. That's God helping you grow. But if you stay that gimme, gimme stage, that's on you, friend, and that's on me. We grow based on how much we want to grow. Number three, a way to prevent stunted growth in your life is be a fervent soul winner. Because you'll never stay stagnant when you see other people get excited over their salvation. Brother Thomas, am I right? You'll never stay stagnant. My wife and I, we were handing out gospel tracts yesterday. We went to Dunkin' Donuts. That's the, the second best place in church. Amen. <laughs> then, then Krispy Kreme. It's, it's number, Krispy Kreme is number two if they have fresh donuts. All right. Now the, you can hit the altar. Amen. All right. Come on. Well, listen. I gave them, I gave them a gospel, both of them a gospel track. I, I set it out and I said, here, ladies, here's, I want to give you something good to read. It tells you about how you can get to heaven. Just a simple little thing. And, and as soon as I turned away, they picked it up, and one of them started reading it, right, honey? One of them started reading it right away. That got me excited. And you know what I did more after that? I passed on more gospel tracts. Because I'm excited about representing my Savior, Jesus Christ, and getting people introduced to the wonderful, precious Son of God. And you'll never be stagnated if you get excited about the things of God like that. Now, I'll tell you, right, the one time that I did do something right, there's about a thousand other times I've done it wrong. But it comes down to this. How much do you want to grow? How much do you want to prosper? Not every Christian grows at the same rate. But it's important to grow. I used to work in horticulture. I hate saying that word. Horticulture. And I used to work in True Green, and my job was to... I worked along with arborists and, 
and I would diagnose trees and I would uh, and, uh, diagnose diseases and, and, and infestation of insects. And so I would core trees out, you know, fun job, right? I core trees out and, 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 and inject fertilizer into them and all that stuff. And I don't do that anymore. I don't, I don't know how to do anything anymore. I don't paint. I don't do anything like that anymore. So don't ask me, all right? <laughs> but, but there was a person who came to me. It was in, in St. Charles, one of those ritzy areas. And they said, uh, we're going to rip this tree out. It's a Japanese cherry blossom. Anybody have one of those in their, their house? I don't know if they grow here or not easily, but she had spent, she had spent close to $2,500 on this tree. Just a little tree. $2,500? I'm like, good grief. You could pay for my tuition this summer. But uh, she said, this isn't growing, so I'm just going to rip it out. I said, no, no. I said, let me look at it. She's like, I don't want to buy anything. I said, just let me look at it. And I looked at it, and what was happening is this, that tree wasn't growing like the other one. And so I told her, I said, this isn't normal. This isn't right. I said, do you mind if I investigate it a little bit? And she's like, sure, I'm just going to rip it out anyway. You know what ended up being the problem? They never took the bag off the bottom of the tree stump, the roots. And it stayed that way. Now, here, here's the application here. You stay in this little incubated environment in your house, and you think you're some deep Christian... But then when, when the bag comes ripping off, teenager, when you get out into the real world, then you're going to realize how shallow your faith really is. It doesn't matter how mighty and tall you look like, it's what you're founded in that really is the most important. I told her, I said, rip that bag off of there. And I said, and save yourself $2,500. And you know what happened? It started growing. She had to feed it. She had to water it. But it had to get out of that incubation period of being a baby and grow. See, what could God possibly do with little faith? Matthew 17, 20 talks about that. Even with the faith of the grain of the mustard seed, God said, he could say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. See, even a mustard seed faith has powerful possibilities. And I'm going to add this. How much faith does it need? do you need to be saved? How much faith does it take to be saved? Just a little faith. In a moment, just a little faith in a moment. That means, what if that, Pastor, what if that means that, you know, they get, they get saved and then they abandon it? Well, that's between them and God. But if they had in a heart of faith, call out to God in that moment and trust in Him, that was enough to save them. And God keeps them saved. You see, you don't need much faith. All you need is the faith to say that I believe what the Bible says about Jesus as the Son of God, that He is the atonement for sin. I believe in all that. And if you do believe that and you repent of your sin and, and, re, and admit to God that you deserve a penalty called hell, then God says in His loving kindness and His mercy, He'll reach down and save you. Even a mustard seed can produce great things. Number two, I want you to see that the next category is we had first little faith, now great faith. Would you look at Matthew chapter 8? You should be there, not too far. Matthew chapter 8, and verse number 5, I want you to see. We're going to skip down for time's sake. I want you to see in verse number 10, Jesus is responding, and he addresses the centurion who tells him, he says, God, I don't, Jesus, I don't even... I'm not even worth you being in my home. What I would like for you to do is, is just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. This is a man who's selfless. This is a, a matured man. And not even an Israelite, by the way. We're going to look at that in a second. But I want you to see in verse number 10 what Jesus does. We looked at that word marveled. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so, say these two words, please, great faith. Great faith. No, not in Israel. If anybody should have had faith in Jesus Christ, it should have been the Israelites. This is why Jesus goes further and says in verse number 12 that the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. So you know who he's talking about? The Israelites. That's prophetical of their rejection of him as Messiah. But Jesus addresses this man and he talks about his faith. And then in Matthew 15, verse 28, you saw the Syrophoenician woman. 
You can look there for just a second, but we're going to get on to the rest of the, the point here, the Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. The first person we see this morning of the candidate of great faith is a person who had authority, power, prestige. To simply put it, he had everything he could ever need and want but he didn't have the ability to perform a miracle aside from having Jesus do it. When we see this passage very few times in the Bible, do you ever see Jesus marveling about something? Very few times does does something get the attention of God so much that he marvels. Marveling is, wow! Oh my goodness! Are you kidding me? That's marveling. Jesus marveled. You know why? Because I believe the Israelites, if anybody should have been at, at coming to Jesus for these kind of things and having this kind of faith, but a non Jew comes to Jesus, somebody who Jesus didn't come for at that moment, says, I know that you can do this, I have the faith that you can perform this. You see, not only was he a non-Jew, but he was a man of great position. Can I tell you this? More power equals more pride. A person who stands in a position of power doesn't really usually depend on a lot of people. They think, well, I've got enough power and ability, I can do this. That man, a centurion, okay, he was a, he was a man of war. He was a man of war, all right? And he was in charge of those other men of war. That man had pride in the good sense and probably some pride in the bad sense, but he didn't let his position affect his position with God. Not only was that, he was a Roman. Jews were slaves. So here he comes to Jesus in the Roman eyes, a slave, and asks him to do something. Asks him to perform a, a miracle in his life. But not only that was why Jesus marveled, but number four, he had expectant faith. Because he expected that Jesus could and would do something miraculous. This type of faith brings remarkable blessings in the life of the Christian. Now, look up here and listen. Please, don't fall asleep on me because we're getting right into the real meat of the message here. This is the faith that God wants you to have. This is the faith that gets the attention of God in your life. And God says, would to, would to, would to God that you have the level of faith that this man had. That's what he wants. And he's, he's, he's showing this as an example to the people all around him. This is why he's exclaiming. This is why. Because of the example that this man led. led. With great faith, we can see God do some remarkable things in Trident. We can see God do things like, oh, I don't know, build the bus route. Having faith in God and having faith in that ministry is going to keep that thing growing. Another ministry that we need to have faith in is our faith promised missions. Again, faith promised missions. Little faith, little investment. Much faith, much investment. I didn't put a dollar mark, a remark uh, mark by that. I'm just telling you, the more faith you have in God, the more you'll be vested into the work of God. That's just how it works. You'll increase your church attendance, being faithful in the house of God. If you believe this place is important, support it. And I'm not just talking this. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about you being here. You being here is going to show your faith in this place and your faith in God. You being in a a representation of Trident, not just here, but out there, that's telling people, my faith is real, and it's beyond what just coming to this pew and leaving out of that door. My faith is more matured than that. I'm representing Trident Baptist Church, and most importantly, my precious Savior, in a world that would reject him, I am going to be the example in front of everybody because of the great faith that God has fostered in my life. 
not only will you see those increases, but you'll see an increase in your, probably your answered prayers in your life. We see that faith is very much tied to prayer. And if you want God to answer your prayer requests and your needs, just like these people did, it takes faith. With great faith, we see who we really are. Matthew 15, the Bible says in verse number 26, But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. See, a woman of faith like that, she didn't say, Well, how dare you? How would you ever call me? No, she didn't do that. She recognized I am unworthy and not somebody who you should pay attention to. But because of my faith, I know I'll garner your intention. When we have great faith, we see how high and mighty God really is. And in return, we see how low, how we really are. Because you're not looking at yourself as the result or as the person who's going to bring results into your life. You can't be the father that you need to be, dear sir. Neither can I. You can't be the mother that you need to be or the, the Christian. That, but aside from your heavenly father, who you need to have faith in every single day, that's what's going to determine what kind of response you'll have like this lady did. Having great faith doesn't mean we know what's going to happen, though. That's why it's faith. She was not guaranteed that Jesus would heal her. In fact, when she asked him the need, Jesus didn't say, sure, I'll heal you. He didn't do that. Right. He responded and said, it is not me for the children's bread to be given to the dogs. And in that moment, you know what most people do? Well, I don't need you. I mean, am I wrong? They get confronted with truth. Listen, they get confronted with the truth of the word of God. It offends them, and they turn away. But you know what? When the word of God offends you, it's not you. It's your pride. When, when, when preaching's up here, and something's happened out of the word of God, and God's hitting on something in your heart, okay, it's not me attacking you. It's the word of God convicting you. And be glad that it is. Because God's not done with you. But this woman, she responded. She submitted to God. She didn't know the outcome. See, to, to, to tag on to this, I want you to listen to this quote. Faith requires us to live in the unseen realm of possibilities. Faith requires us to live in the unseen realm of possibilities. There are all kinds of opportunities all kinds of possibilities out there, but faith is what you're holding on to until those possibilities become realities. I'm not one of those preachers, just name it and claim it. I'm not those preachers because that's not in the Bible. Okay, just because, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna faith it into its existence. Well, I imagine probably Paul had a lot of faith and said, I'm not going to get scourged anymore. I don't want to get stoned anymore. I'm not going to get in prison anymore. But that man had faith in God. Right. See, faith doesn't change your circumstances. Right. doesn't always change those, those real-world situations. When we don't know where to go when those situations come in our life, we must listen to the voice of our Heavenly Father to give us direction. I want to tell you a story. One night, a house caught fire of a family. And most of the family got out, and, and this, this uh, once smoldering flame became a blazing inferno. And the entire lower level was engulfed in flames. And the mother and the two daughters are outside, and, and the dad is outside, and all of a sudden he hears this scream, of his little boy upstairs, <clears throat> fearful. The, the dad began to yell and scream to the son, son, get out on the roof. His, his window was right on the pitch of the roof. And he said, get out on the roof, son. He says, but I'm scared, dad. I'm scared. He says, I know, buddy, but you got to listen to me. 
And the boy got on the roof and he said, Now, son, I want you to listen really closely. Listen to me. This is life or death. I want you to jump. The mother standing in sh shock and horror as the, the scene unfolding and the, the dad standing there. And the boy screams out, But daddy, I can't see you. The dad returned and said, But, but son, I can see you and that's all that matters. I can see you and that's all that matters. Listen, you may not see God today. Look at me. I'm trying to help you, okay? Listen, you may not see God in your life today, but I'm telling you right now, as sure as I know of my own salvation, as I sure as know as my own name, I know he knows where you are. Leap to him in faith. Stop talking to your, 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 your uh, psychiatrist and stop talking to them because they don't know where you are. They may think that they do and they may have some degree that says they can peer into your brain and figure you out. But listen, your God in heaven knows who you are much more than anybody else. Amen. He knows you and he knows where you're at and he knows the situation you're in and all he's saying is jump to me. Jump. So many Christians, they were willing to stand on the roof and go down in that blazing inferno then trust the precious protective hands of God. You see, God knows the end from the beginning. And it takes a person with great faith not just to comprehend that, but believe that. Third, I want you to see, we have little faith, great faith, no faith. Mark 6 Mark chapter 6, verse number 6. I'm just going to read the verse, introduce you to the text, and we'll continue the message. Mark 6, 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He, and he went round about the villages teaching. You know what this place is, who he's referring to is? Nazareth. Where was Jesus from? Nazareth. As we discussed earlier that Jesus told the disciple they had little faith. Another passage, he told them they had no faith. I want to tell you, the people that saw Jesus do the most had the most doubt that we could see sometimes. Look at Thomas. What do we call him, Brother Suter? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Look at Peter. Walked on the water. Had no faith in Jesus. What about... John the Baptist. Do we look for another? Didn't he say that? I don't care what, how deep of a Christian you really think you are, or I am, you will get to a point where you might have no faith. You might get there. What you need to come to the realization is remind yourself of who God is. No faith can be categorized as unbelief. What we do know is Jesus, the Bible says, did not mighty works in Nazareth because of the familiarity of Jesus, which led to their unbelief. They said, no, there's no way. This is Jesus, the son of God. This is, this is Jesus, the son of Joseph. He's the carpenter's son. They let their skewed vision of who Jesus really was affect what was going to be the outcome. When we practice unbelief in our life, we can withhold the powerful, mighty, omnipotent hand of God performing things in our life. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Doesn't the Bible say that? Didn't we see that? God says, I'm going to do something, but only if you desire it. If you don't desire it, you don't have the faith that comes with it, guess what's not going to happen in your life? What you're hoping will happen. We look back at Abraham and Sarah and the response to God, telling them they have a child. What did they do? They laughed. Right? Sarah laughed. How sad it must be when God proclaims something and our response is that we smirk and laugh at it. 
You know, I, I, don't, believe, I don't believe it's a too far realistic, uh, rea- it's not too far of a reality that maybe one day we outgrow this church and have to build one over that other field. Amen. Now, how, how, what will happen with that is how you just responded to that. Right. Yeah, okay. Listen, five years ago, this place should have been shut down. Now, some of you that are here visiting or uh, haven't been here, remember, this place was doing the death rattle. Brother Thomas, am I right? right. Death rattle. It was about ready to shut down. But God said, oh, I see some people in there with faith. I'm going to do something. Those of you that stuck around, say amen right there. Go ahead. I see a a group of people that have some faith. I'm going to keep this thing going a little longer. See, God cares about this work. You know, I hope, may it be, God, that we do do that. May it be that this church is a, such a wonderful beacon of hope that and, and, and becomes a real testimony because just because it has Baptist on it don't mean a hill of beans because it, there are too many churches, too many pastors, too many church members who are, who are compromising on the truths of the Word of God. And, and Charleston and Berkeley County needs Trident Baptist Church. They need these buses going. They need people on Saturday knocking on doors. They need people with great faith, not no faith. They need people with that. How miserable we must be as Christians when we have no faith in our life. Christians living with no faith is like a fish living with no water. They'll die. You see, our works, look at James 2, our works... Show our faith. James chapter number 2, verse 17. You know that passage of scripture. It's a familiar passage, but I want you to see it. James 2, 17. And I'm almost done. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So your faith is going to be proven by your works. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to have, those works are an evidence of your faith. Works have nothing to do with, with your faith as far as being saved, but they are the evidence of whether or not you really are saved. That's why the Bible says, Jesus said, by your fruits you shall know them, right? This is why as a pastor, I, I, I look at the, look at our church and, and I, I look at people and I'll say, okay, they say they're saved. I'm going to watch them just as much as you should watch me. Because if I don't see fruit, that might be concerning. I should be seeing works that prove your faith. So should this world. So should these lost people in this community. They should see our works be proven, proving our faith. Can I tell you today? If we truly believe something, it will motivate you. Listen, it will motivate you to action. Do you believe souls are valuable? Do you believe souls are valuable, church? What are you doing about it to prove that? Jesus said that souls are valuable. He proved that by his crucifixion on the cross, his sacrifice. How are you and I proving that souls mean something to us? We ought to be giving them the gospel. We ought to be inviting them to this church. We ought to be being a representation of Jesus Christ in the workplace. That's showing people souls are valuable. In closing, number four, God works with what faith we give him. In all the situations, God took what level of faith they presented him, and he did the miracle they looked for. The saying is, is God gives to us with the same shovel that we give to him. God, when he sees our faith, rewards us according to our faith. These examples that we read this morning, the common idea that we see today is that God paid attention to their faith. And I want to tell you today, God is paying attention to your faith and mine. And he's providing opportunities for you to grow your faith, i.e. trials. I.e. tribulation, sickness, loss. 
God's trying to increase your faith. God's trying to grow you in him, to make you more dependent on him. Sometimes wives become too dependent on their husbands rather than upon God. They say, as long as I have my husband, I, I now listen, God needs you, right. and you need God. So, husbands depend on their wives. Uh, too many people depend on their pastor. I'm not God. Believe me, follow me around for a little while. You'll realize I'm the furthest example of what you ought to be looking at. But I'm going to tell you, God brings these things in here to make you more dependent on him. That's what faith is. Faith makes you dependent on something or someone. How deep is your faith tonight or this morning? How deep is it? Is it shallow? Or is it so deep that you haven't reached the bottom yet? The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Why is it difficult for us to, as Christians today sometimes to trust God with the other aspects of life? I mean, you, you trusted him with the most important decision of your life, accepting him as your savior. Why can't we just trust him with the other things? It should be easy. It should be first in nature. You'd think that this, the single most major decision you could make is whether or not you go to heaven or hell. You Make the decision to trust Christ, and then now, all the other things in life and all the other circumstances, God's not capable to trust. He's not capable to be, have faith in. Today, Christian, I want to challenge you. Trust God. Have faith in Him. Don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at your problems. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've never had faith in God to ask you to forgive him of your sins. As I said a moment ago, all you need is just a little bit of faith. Just a little bit. You say, well, I don't know. I can't. Listen, all you need is just a little bit. Jesus points us to the example of little children. Little children are the, the wonderful I mean, embodiment of faith. Aren't they? Amen. I mean, they trust you implicitly. They trust you with no proofs. They just believe you're going <laughs> to hold up your end of the bargain. That's why Jesus said that, I'll accept you to be as one of these. He said, unless you act, have the heart and the faith and the mind of a child, you're not getting into heaven. Have faith in God. Maybe you're, as I said, I was addressing you. Maybe you don't know that you can go to heaven one day. You can have that right now. You can, have, you can have that gift of forgiveness and eternal life today. That has nothing to do with what church membership you're affiliated with. has everything to do with a person. His name is Jesus Christ. You need to trust him today before it's eternally too late. Because one day you will die and you will answer for your sins. And you will spend an eternity in hell if you don't get your sins forgiven. You can get that done today. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes?